If you're a residential real estate agent earning $200,000 a year and you want to grow your passive income, this show's for you. Learn the secrets other agents use and hear from experts in our field in order to guide you along your journey to investing in assets like apartment communities so that you can turn your commissions into cash flow. I'm Randall DeCleared. Let's go, baby. All right, all right, agents, welcome back to Agents Building Cash Flow. Excited to have you here today. Uh, we have a special guest. His name is John Brixon. He is the founder and principal of McKinney Realty Capital. He's a seasoned expert in the commercial uh, lending field. And I'm excited to talk to him because there have been a lot of changes in the debt market in the last few years, um, financing multifamily properties and that sort of thing. So I thought bringing on an expert in the field would be the best to address some of those issues and give some advice going forward. Um, so he's got over 10 years experience and he's done over 750 million in financing volume over 80 plus deals. So obviously there's a wealth of knowledge there, a lot of experience seeing the, the back end of those transactions in order to understand what the equity looks like, what the debt markets look like, how deals are getting done, they're transacting, that sort of thing. So definitely pay attention, take a pen, paper, you know, take some notes. We go through some very dense in, con, information in the very intro to the show. And so you'll see and understand how much knowledge he has just in a very, very quick <laughs> intro to the show. So we unpack that a bit. Um, we discuss the debt market. He, like I said, he gives some advice on starting out. If you're new to the multifamily space, kind of some of the things that you should be working on, uh, building your team and that, and that sort of thing. He drops knowledge bombs throughout the entire episode. So um, obviously, I don't want to spoil all of that. Uh, he does go over some red flags you should look out for if you're looking at offerings from other sponsors. And then we talk uh, his personal investing journey because he's doing the same thing. He's an agent of the deals. He is trying to translate some of his active income on the lending side of the business into some passive deals. So he's invested as a limited partner. Um, he recently bought a multifamily deal himself. He's been a key principal on some things. So again, he's got a wide range of experience and I know you're going to get a lot of, uh, out of it. So uh, let's bring him on the show. Let's get started. Let's go. All right, John, it's great to have you on. It's good to see you again. Um, we've been catching up a little bit here and there um, in some of the stuff that we're working on. So I appreciate you taking the time to jump on, share your knowledge and, uh, and talk with us about the debt markets and real estate financing. So uh, thanks for jumping on. Yeah, thank you, Randall. Good to be here. All right. So as someone with extensive experience, and commercial real estate financing and investing. I'm sure you've seen the industry evolve uh, over the years. So I know, and, and all operators and anybody in real estate really knows that there's been a rapid rise in interest rates in recent markets, and that's created some headwinds for, and some challenges just for getting some deals done. So aside from that, in your opinion, what's been the most significant change in the debt market for multifamily operators? And, and how is it impacting their ability to secure financing for deals? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the multifamily financing market and the, the commercial real estate financing market will will change as we as we go through the cycle. And depending on where we are in the cycle, that seems to kind of depend. That that seems to drive what types of products are, are most popular and what types of products most borrowers are are financing with. And so, you know, what we saw was from you know just kind of looking at the last ten years or so. From 2013 up through about 2018, 19, um, really up to about COVID, a lot of people were financing their acquisitions, at least on multifamily properties, with uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans, and that was really driven by where cap rates were relative to where interest rates were. And the reason I say that is because you know Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac they can go down to a minimum 1.25 times debt service coverage ratio. So they'll go up to 80% LTV, but the property's in-place cash flow has to be able to support the in-place debt service by at least 1.25 times. And what we saw was, uh, you know, cap rates really came down uh, quite a bit, you know, especially coming out of COVID uh, with all the stimulus that came into the system. And so cap rates came down, interest rates increased slightly, at least up until 12 months ago when they really started to increase a lot, a lot more quick. And so what that really created was a situation where, you know, you could only cover at a 1.25 times debt service coverage at about, you know, 55 to 60% of the purchase price. So you really just couldn't get good leverage uh, with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac type loans. 
And so, uh, you know, there was, there was that. And then the other, the other drawback with Fannie and Freddie is that their loans typically are what's called, uh, have a, what's called a yield maintenance or a defeasance prepayment penalty and yield maintenance and defeasance. Like the cost of yield maintenance and defeasance is really driven largely by where interest rates are in the current marketplace. And so really what, what yield maintenance and defeasance are, or what yield maintenance is, is it is the, the pre, it's your prepayment penalty is equal to the net present value of all remaining interest payments on the loan. So if you were to do a 10, 10 year Fannie Mae loan and at year five, you decide you wanna sell the property or you wanna refi the property, at year five, you'd have five years of interest payments remain on that loan. So the time of payoff, you as the borrower would need to pay uh, the net present value of all remaining interest payments on that loan. And so a yield maintenance prepayment penalty is driven by one, how much term is remaining on the loan, but then two, um, what was your interest rate at the time you close a loan versus where are market interest rates today? And so what we saw was that um, interest rates really dropped from the time people closed on their loans to the time they wanted to prepay their loans. And so that really drove yield maintenance, maintenance costs way higher. And so a lot of people who, who bought properties in 2017, for instance, they saw very you know great appreciation on their properties, a lot of rent growth, a lot of NOI growth. And after three, four years, they were ready to sell or refinance the property. And the problem was, was because, because interest rates dropped and they had a yield maintenance prepayment penalty, they had these extremely high uh, prepayment penalties that, that they had to, uh, you know, basically just just swallow when they went to sell a refi. And so, what we saw was number one, um, a lot of these loans became DSCR constrained at 55, 60 percent LTV in the period after COVID, and then um, a lot of people were burned by these high yield maintenance prepayment penalties. So people really kind of swore off the fixed rate yield maintenance or defeasance type loans that Fannie and Freddie oftentimes will offer. And they started to move into the floating rate loans. And with floating rate loans, those are the interest rates on those obviously are they're floating or they're adjustable rates. So your interest rate might be what's called term SOFR. So SOFR is the secured overnight funding rate. And that is really just a short-term index that is uh, directly impacted by the Fed funds rate. So whenever the Fed hikes rates 25 basis points, SOFR is directly impacted. And so people, you know, so a floating rate loan or adjustable rate loan, your rate will be SOFR plus the spreads. So that might be SOFR plus 200 or 250 or 300. And so for a long time, SOFR was at zero. It stayed at zero as, you know, the, the Fed had this policy of, uh, you know, zero interest rates into perpetuity, basically. And a lot of people felt like, it was going to be at least in the perpetuity. So really everyone felt comfortable with a floating rate loan. You know, they didn't foresee the Fed hiking from, from zero to 5%, you know, over a 12 month time frame. And so what happened was, uh, you know, and then the other benefit too with the floating rate loans is that um, they have the prepan penalty is not defeasance or yield maintenance. It's typically just 1% of the loan amount. And so a lot of borrowers felt like, hey, I can do this floating rate loan. Interest rates will stay close to zero. And I'll have a 1% prepay instead of having to deal with a, a, a defeasance or a yield maintenance. And I'm okay with taking the interest rate risk just because my outlook is that, you know, interest rates are going to stay close to zero for, you know, a long period of time, or at least throughout the whole of my loan. And so people started to transition into floating rate loans in, in 2020. And you can do floating rate loans with, with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but the largest provider of floating rate loans really were bridge lenders. And a lot of these bridge lenders, they are uh, private debt funds or private mortgage REITs or other types of non-bank uh, type lenders. And so a lot of these, a lot of these bridge lenders became very active in the market in 20, late 2020, 2021, first half of 2022. And, you know, one key difference with bridge loans versus Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans, whether it's a floating rate loan or it's a fixed rate loan, those loans are also, they're all debt service constrained at a 1.25 times debt service coverage ratio based on the in-place cash flow. Bridge loans are not debt service constrained. They can go up to 80% of purchase price plus 100% of CapEx. 
And what bridge lenders are really looking at are what is the pro forma? What are the projected cash flows? If I, if I make a loan uh, today at 80% LTC, will the property's value increase? Will the property's cash flow increase so that in year two or year three, once that bridge loan matures, can I get refinanced out of uh, the existing bridge loan? And so people moved into bridge loans in 2020 to 2022. And then the Fed started to hike interest rates aggressively. And that impacted a number of different factors. But you know, the largest thing that really impacted was the fact that people who had floating rate loans, now they're seeing their interest rates start to increase due to the Fed, the Fed hiking. And so people today um, are shying away from doing bridge loans, the floating rate loans more so. Um, you know, a lot of borrowers are, are trying to finance their acquisitions with a Fannie Mae or a Freddie Mac fixed rate loan if they can get it. You know, those loans are still 55 to 65% LTV. And cap rates for multifamily properties or for other, any other types of real estate properties will have to ultimately increase in order for them to be able to get to 70, 75, 80% LTV. So a lot of folks are, are, are doing, you know, fixed rate Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac acquisitions in the current market, um, here in April, 2023. But, we still see some people who are doing bridge loans and, um, you know, there's, we're still seeing some situ- situations where, you know, it, it makes sense to, to buy a property and, and finance the acquisition with a bridge loan. Yeah, man, a lot in there. You ha- have so much knowledge and it's, it's like, that is a recap. So there's a lot of terms thrown around in there. If you are unfamiliar with some of those terms, then by all means reach out. We can cover those in a little bit more detail, but in general, that is a, like, a short recap of what has happened in the in the last you know like six years or so. It's awesome. So I have a couple of questions that stuck out to me specifically, and we'll kind of run through those. When is yield maintenance worth doing? Like, why was that even a thing? And, and is it in a rising interest? You're taking a bet that the rates are going to go up, and so your prepay is going to go down, or it's going to be shrinking. That's kind of so you're sitting there doing some just betting, yeah. essentially. That's that. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, it's really depends on you know what is your outlook for interest rates and if you're doing a 10-year fixed rate loan with a yield maintenance prepayment penalty the benefit to you as a borrower is you, you have some downside protection there because your your interest rate is fixed and so it's predictable you know what your interest rate is going to be in year three in year seven in year 10 but the negative is is that if you do really increase the value on the property and if interest rates decline during your hold period, you can be in a situation where you have a much higher prepayment penalty. Yeah. And in fact, because interest rates have been increasing recently, there are some borrowers that took fixed rate loans in 2021, 22, when interest rates were quite a bit lower. And that's actually helped, um, that's actually helped them with selling their properties because they can sell their property. The buyer can assume that fixed rate loan. And a lot of times these, these loan assumptions that people are doing when they're assuming a Fannie Mae or a Freddie Mac loan, they're assuming a, a loan with a much lower interest rate than, than what's market. So, I mean, we've seen, you know, we've seen some properties that are listed for sale that, you know, there's, there's a Fannie Mae loan with a 3.5% interest rate on it currently. Current Fannie Mae interest rates are, you know, 5.25, 5.5%. And so, um, you know, let's say I, I bought a property for $10 million, you know, three years ago, and I financed that acquisition with a $7.5 million loan that has a 3.5% interest rate. If I'm selling it today, and let's say I'm selling it for $13 million, a lot of borrowers will find that loan very attractive to assume because they're getting, you know, 60% or so LTV. They're taking a 3.5% interest rate. And um, that's actually helped a lot of sellers uh, get their property sold in the current market. We're seeing a lot of borrowers do assumption assumptions. On the flip side, if I buy a property today and I, I do a uh, for $10 million and I take a $7.5 million Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan and interest rate, my interest rate of my loan is 5.5%, but then we get into a situation where interest rates drop from 3.5% or drop down to 3.5%. And I want to sell the property in three years when interest rates are at three and a half percent. 
well, now I'm stuck with, you know, hey, I have this 5.5% rate loan where much higher than prevailing market rate loans. And, you know, most likely you're going to have to pay that large prepayment penalty. So it's, yeah. you know, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword with, with everything. It's, um, yeah, unfortunately, it's, it's hard to have your cake and eat, and eat it too. Prepayment penalties versus fixed and floating rate loans. You know, you can take a fixed rate yeah. loan, but you're stuck with a yield maintenance or a defeasance prepay, or you can take a floating rate loan but you have interest rate risk and you have a 1% prepay. I would say the, the in between on those two things is you can do uh, what's called step down prepay, where it's not 1%, it's not yield maintenance, but it might be a 5% loan amount in year one, 5% in year two, 4% in year three, 4% in year four. And so you actually have a points-based declining prepay throughout the term. So that's that's one way some borrowers will get around uh, the pre pan penalties as well. Yeah. We're proud to be sponsored by Ridgeline Investment Group. Ridgeline has a track record of transacting more than 53 million in assets throughout Texas. Ridgeline is currently looking to acquire 100 to 200 unit Class B multifamily communities between five and 20 million in San Antonio, Temple, Waco, Tyler, and other Texas secondary markets. To learn more about Ridgeline Investment Group, visit www.ridgelineig.com. So getting, I guess, into the, the the intro that you were going through, I wrote down a few more things. So I, I want to jump back into that. So you you were talking about the market shifting into the higher leverage because of the bridge loans. And so what are some of the negative impacts to the market that you you see from that or, or, or were there any? Uh, because in my mind, I think of it and the higher the leverage, it makes it easier to to increase the prices on the on the properties, um, and and yet now we're kind of in this situation. So, like, are there? Would you consider that to be a negative thing when when we start seeing leverage go up, or not? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think um, you know, I don't know if I would say it's negative necessarily. I think it's just kind of a natural part of the cycle, and okay. you know, later in the cycle, we often see. Later in like the credit cycle, we often see leverage increasing, underwriting standards start to decline. And so, whereas lenders used to really focus on what is my in place cash flow today, it, it morphed into where will my in place cash flow be in two years or three years once my loan matures. And so, that really allowed borrowers to push their LTVs higher. And which in turn pushed the purchase prices and the pricing higher. And so kind of saw at the end of the most recent cycle is that, you know, purchase prices really started to, to peak and pricing started to peak, but then LTV and leverage was also peaking at that same time. And so, you know, the drawback with, with bridge loans is they are they are riskier execution for, for the borrower and, and for the lender. There are shorter term loans, they're, they're two-year loans or three-year loans with, with extension options. There might be you know two one-year extension options after a three-year initial term. So they're shorter term. And then they also, a lot of times, for the most part, are floating rate loans. Um, and so you're also dealing with that, that interest rate risk during the hold period. And, and you know, there was so much appreciation from you know, coming out of COVID up until first half of 2022, people really became so optimistic with multifamily and where valuations were going, where rent growth was going. There was kind of this mentality that you can't miss just buy any multifamily property you get your hands on and borrow as much money as you can uh, to, to buy it. And um, that's, again, it's a double-edged sword. It, it, it's coming back the other direction now where you know we're seeing values decline and you're seeing people right now who are, you know, simply just overborrowed, and you know the the value of their property might be equal to or or less than the current loan amount. Yeah. So, yeah. Have you seen a shift? Uh, have you seen a shift now? Or are you seeing things come back, uh, like the foreclosure or default rates taken up? Yeah, I mean, we are starting to see um, some stress in the market. There was a there was a four property portfolio in Houston that was foreclosed on uh, last week. There was a two hundred and twenty nine million dollars in, in in loans, and you know that that borrower they they did three hundred they did over three hundred million dollars in bridge loans with one lender in the Houston market in twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two, just 
you know, crazy, crazy amount of activity and just high leverage. And not only did they have bridge loans up to 80% LTC, but they also layered in preferred equity uh, behind that bridge loan. So they were really getting, you know, 90% of the LTV at closing. And then, um, you know, they also faced a lot of different headwinds where, you know, rent growth was flat. You know, they were buying Class C older properties and the lower income areas. So their their delinquency, you know, most likely increased. Uh, they had a number of evictions they had to, they had to uh, deal with. And then expenses, you know, have also increased. I mean, real estate taxes, at least in the Texas markets, have increased. Hopefully, we start to see some relief on real estate taxes as values, as values come down. Um, insurance costs have really gone up. Payroll costs went up repairs and maintenance. So it was really just a perfect storm for them. And on top of all that, you know, they paid top of the market prices with as much broad money as they could get. And so what ultimately ended up happening was they stopped making their loan payments and the lender moved to, to foreclose on those properties. And so, you know, I think, I think we'll see some of that, but it's not isolated to just today. It's not unprecedented. This is, this is the, the real estate cycle. And yeah. we saw it play out. 2008, you know, probably to a more severe extent or a more severe downturn in 2008 versus today. You saw it play out back in the, the early 90s with what was called the, uh, the savings and loans crisis, which, um, you know, impacted a lot of different lenders in the Texas markets. And so it's, um, you know, history doesn't rhyme or doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Yeah. And so I think you will see some more stress in the market. You will see some distress, but I think on the other side of it, you know, the folks that are able to make it to the other side, I think we'll have some great opportunities to to buy properties at, at much more attractive prices. Yeah, for sure. Another thing that popped in my mind when you're going through talking about the uh, the lowering of the LTV that Fannie and Freddie, because they were at what, 70, 75, like typically? Well, Fannie and Freddie, I mean, they, they can go up to 80% LTV and they, yeah. they would go to 80% LTV even in the current market. But what, what Fannie and Freddie do really well is they're very disciplined and very stringent on their underwriting criteria. Yeah. They don't change their underwriting standards. They say, we want a 125 debt service mm-hmm. coverage on the in-place cash flow, regardless of if you're at 60% LTV or if you're at 80% LTV. And you know, we don't care where cap rates are going. You know, if cap rates are higher, you're more likely to be able to get to 80% LTV. But if cap rates go lower, you're probably going to be uh, constrained at at 60% LTV. And I think from 2013 to 2017, it wasn't uncommon to see Fannie and Freddie going at 80% LTV on a purchase price, on an acquisition. I think it'll be a while before we start to see Fannie and Freddie loan size to 80 LTV because what will have to happen is cap rates will just have to increase. Yeah. And I think that will take time for that to, to actually uh, take effect. Yeah. So yeah, in my mind, I'm like, that's kind of a lagging indicator of, could be a leading, I don't know, but I'm trying to figure out how the, the correlation between what they will lend and it's the DSER obviously. Uh, but if you see them pulling their, their loan to, to value down, then maybe the, the market's overheated because that's, that that's something that built into their underwriting. Just thinking, I would agree with that. You know, you know what I mean? Um, I think you're right. Yeah. So, it, because their underwrite seems to be conservative to be able to do that. That's great. Um, just worked it out in my own mind. So, thanks for going through that. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Now, you know, I like, I, I do like their underwrite. I like the conservative approach to it. And then you're actually looking at the deal for what the deal is rather than what you hope it can be. Um, and that's exactly. one of the things that is key. So, if you can get an 80, 80% LTV on a Fannie Freddie, then you know that the deal is pretty solid uh, or hopefully right. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. I mean, it's at least a, a decent cap rate, but you know, on the flip side of that, I would also say, you know, if you're getting 80% LTV, that probably means that it's probably a leading indicator that that cap rates are going to come down because um, if you're getting 80% LTV, you're probably getting a pretty strong going in cash on cash return. Yeah. And, you know, other buyers will enter the market and will start to uh, bid those prices up. And Fannie and Freddie will start to get DSCR constrained at 75%. Then they'll get DSCR constrained at 70%. And then all of a sudden, you know, the bridge lenders flood back into the market 
And we get, we get to, to a point where the, you can only get 55 to 60% LTV with Fannie and Freddie. And that's, that's exactly what we saw. But what was interesting is, you know, for a long, for, for a while there, for probably a five year stretch, you're getting 80% LTV on acquisitions. And then um, it seems like kind of overnight, all these bridge loans just kind of flooded the market and the, the market got, you know, just really shot up. Um, in 20 from end of 2020 through you know first half of 2022, and so yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's almost been, like the uh, almost like a subprime market almost where it's just like okay, yeah, we'll do it on the property and on the on the, but it's not it's not a one to one correlation, but you know in my mind it's yeah there is a correlation there too. The it's easier and it's faster and it's higher higher leverage if you go that that route. So those guys are yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would agree. I mean, I think subprime is, is you know, so, somewhat about right. I mean, I think, you know, the one difference, like the subprime boom in the 2008 crisis was, you know, that was really driven by like consumer credit. Yeah. And that was a lot of different, you know, residential home buyers, you know, being able to qualify for mortgages, you know, really with no documentation, no proof of income, you know, anything like that. You know, the multifamily market, fortunately, is much, much smaller than the the residential mortgage market. So that's one reason why, um, you know, I think 2008 is probably quite a bit more severe than what we're going to see and, you know, this current down cycle. But the two parallels with it are a lot of times, a lot of these loans end up getting packaged into bonds and securitized. And, you know, if lenders are able to move, move these loans off their balance sheet quickly through securitization, they tend to be a little bit more uh, lax on their, their loan standards just because, they're not holding the loan at the end of the day. They're they're shifting that risk to whoever's buying that loan from them. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So what what do you see? I guess what are some trends or opportunities right now in the current debt market for for multifamily? Well, I think right now is, you know, if for anyone that's interested in getting into multifamily and wants to start buying multifamily, I think it's a great time to get started. And it's a great time to educate yourself, network start building your team, you know, find, find partner, a partner. If you need a partner, find, find someone to buy multifamily properties with, you know, if you're going to be buying your first multifamily property, or if you're really looking to scale up, there's a few different things, a few different boxes you need to check, you know, you and, or your partner need to have, you know, ideally someone has multifamily experience, you know, experience buying multifamily properties and, and signing on loans for multifamily properties. So that's, that's one box to check. You know, another box to check is, is net worth and liquidity. So, you know, a lot of times multifamily lenders like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, for example, would typically require you and your partners to have combined net worth equal to 100% of the loan amount and then combined liquidity equal to 10% of the loan amount. So, you know, if you're doing a $5 million loan, these lenders will want to see that you and your partner have combined net worth equal to 5 million, combined liquidity equal to 500,000. So I think it's a good time to be getting your ducks in a row, starting to network with potential investors, limited partners, and passive investors that can invest with you on properties that, that you want to buy and you know, position yourself to be able to buy multifamily properties. And if you're if you're an active multifamily investor, you have loans that are outstanding right now, you know, that say you have bridge loans right now, it's you know, I I would be taking a look at what's like in my T12, where's my in-place cash flow? Can I qualify for a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan today that can take out my existing bridge loan? If not, where does my cash flow need to be in order for me to be able to take out Fannie Mae and Freddie or my existing bridge loan with the Fannie or Freddie loan? And you know, can I actually get to that level? If not, what what's my plan uh, to get out of this? Do I need to do a capital call? Can I sell the property and get out of the existing loan? And really just trying to, you know, kind of build a fortress around your own personal balance sheet and get to a point where hopefully in 2024, when a lot of these loans are maturing, you're in a position where you can go on the offensive and you can take advantage of some of these different deals that we'll see in the market instead of, you know, being on defense and, and having to put out fires. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And speaking to that, building the team out and and, and all that, so what's what are some strategies for building relationships with guys like yourself you know is it like uh hey let's go to coffee or like what what building your team out talking to lenders and that sort of thing like just growing your network in that sense in order to secure favorable financing 
Is it courting every every lender you talk to? Going yeah. down one? Like what what do you think? Yeah, no, for sure. I think um finding finding a good uh experienced financing professional, whether it's a a, a commercial mortgage broker like myself or you know a direct lender. Here's our personal financial statement, you know, sharing that with them and allowing them to review that to, you know, see what kind of loan you and your partner can qualify currently. So I think doing those types of those types of things. And then as uh, you know, as a lot of us already know, listing brokers, at least in the Texas markets and, and for multifamily, you know, really control the market and they have all the different deals. So um, you want to get in front of listing brokers. Make sure that you're seeing the properties that they're selling, the properties they're listing for sale. And then, you know, as different properties come in the market, go ahead and, and underwrite those and see if they're a good fit. And, you know, what I would say is if you are interested in, in buying a property, you know, for me at least, it's never too early to reach out. We're happy to take a look at whatever you're buying and provide some feedback on, on what types of loan terms are available for that property. And you know, ultimately, you can use our loan terms to underwrite the acquisition. So, what I would say is, uh, it's never too early to reach out for um, getting a good read on on what the financing will be, and you know, it can be before you even submit an offer. And um, so, I would just say, you know, staying in front of your loan broker, staying in front of listing brokers to make sure that you're seeing their deals. And then just continuing to underwrite um, acquisitions, you know, once you once you have your team in place. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I've got a question. Obviously, you see a number of deals. You're, you're you have a unique position in the debt structure, in the, I guess in the multifamily structure because you get to see a lot of deals that come through, and and you're early in that conversation. So, um, and then you're involved throughout the close. So, um, you get to see the equity raise and challenges people may be facing in that in that arena as well. So to that point, right now in this environment, have you seen uh, operators having a challenge or is it pretty easy to raise? Is it deal specific, operator specific, or or what are you seeing on that side of it? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think right now the equity raising environment is more challenging, you know, for sure. I think even for more experienced sponsors, um, you know, it's a challenging market to to raise equity. What I would say is if, if you are um, wanting to buy a property currently, you know, I think it, I think ideally it's an equity raise that you're, you're very comfortable with and that you feel confident you can execute on. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe the last property you bought was a $10 million purchase price and the total equity raise was, was $3 million. You know, maybe for the next property you buy in the current cycle, you may, maybe you target a, a $6 million property with a, you know, a $2 million equity raise just to be, just to kind of test the waters and, and you know see if you're able to close on it. So I'd say the equity raise environment is it is a little bit more challenging, but on the flip side, there's not as much competition on acquisitions. There's not as many people who are who are bidding on properties that are currently in the market. And uh, a lot of times the purchase and sale agreement, you know, in 2021, a lot of borrowers were having to on most of these purchase and sale agreements, people were having to put up two percent of the purchase price as non-refundable earnest money day one. So, you know, if you're buying a $10 million property, um, you and your partners were having to put up $200,000 in non-refundable deposits just to get the property under contract. And what we're seeing is that the the, um, sales environment has become less competitive. And so, you know, you might be able to buy a property and maybe your earnest money isn't isn't non-refundable until, you know, week two or, you know, the fourth week of the contract. Um, So it really just depends. But yeah, I I would say it is it is a more challenging environment um, for equity racing right now. Yeah. So I I, I was talking to a few retail guys and and commercial real real estate guys. And um, one of them was he's he's in Detroit, but he's telling me about some of the deals that he's looking at and how he's um, he kind of kicking himself. He didn't buy something early in his career because he was underwriting himself out of the deal right and so i've heard guys talk about that and and so it seems like multifamily um if you weren't underwriting in in the recent years if you weren't underwriting for year two cash flow and year two performa numbers then you weren't winning a deal so like right now are you seeing a, a return to like in place cash flow underwriting 
that is that is working because it's obviously more conservative than the the year two you know are you seeing that or is it still like and, and even some brokers i talk to they're they're like sure yeah, you need to underwrite pro forma numbers not not on in place and so yeah i'm just kind of curious. yeah yeah no i would agree with that i think a lot more people now are focused on the in place cash flow and really underwriting based on what is the in place cash flow um, you know, going in cap rates have become a lot more important. And there's people who are filtering out anything that has going in cap rate less than five and a half percent, you know, they won't even look at. I would agree uh, with a lot of these brokers that I think that I think that is a mistake. I think people should also be looking at pro forma and thinking about, you know, how much upside is there in the cash flow here? And, you know, I think I think a lot of the best deals coming out of this this downturn are going to be properties that have very low in place cash flow. You know, the best the best opportunities might be properties that are 70% occupied and the NOI is, you know, barely positive. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad deal. Um, it could just mean that, you know, the in place cash flow is very depressed. But then by the time you execute on the business plan and, and get the property stabilized, stabilized cap rate might be, you know, well above where market cap rates are. You know, you might have stabilized cash flow at eight percent, an eight percent cap rate, where you know market cap rates are at six percent, and like that's a that's a pretty good spread yeah. because you know then you can go and sell that property at a six percent cap rate, and that difference between the eight percent and the two percent, you know, that, that's that's your profit, you know, as yeah. as the uh, investor. So, I would say. Um, I would consider everything out there that's that's in the market, whether the in-price cash flow is really depressed or the in-price cash flow is strong, you're able to buy at a higher cap rate. So it's a little bit of a balancing act. Yeah. All right. That's good advice. So I want to bring it back to the to the lending side. So, you know, like agents, the, the whole show is agents called cash flow, trying to get more agents to invest, passively get them into syndications, get them into funds, get them to to like start building their cash flow, turning the active income into, into passive income. So um, if I'm an agent and I'm I'm looking at like a syndication um, as an LP, you know, like what are some red flags that they should look out for in sponsor offerings um, uh, from your perspective, either the debt side or just from your experience? Sure. Yeah. And, and I can relate to that because I'm also an agent and I'm paid on commissions. And I my my whole goal is to turn my commissions into cash flow. And so I personally invest in multifamily, I invest in industrial as well. I and then I also I own properties, you know, multifamily properties, you know, on my own. Um, one I, I own with no partners, another one I'm a key principal on, and I have a couple of other partners, and we have passive investors on that as well. And so I'm I'm totally familiar with that as well. And and what I really look for if I'm investing passively, I think uh, one thing that people really disregarded, I think, in 2021 and 2022, early part of 2022, that that I think is going to end up coming back to to haunt some of these passive investors is what is the what is the capital stack look like? What does the financing structure look like? Is someone buying a property and are they taking, you know, a 75 or 80 percent uh bridge loan? With preferred equity behind that bridge loan going up to 85% or up to 90%, how much are they talking? You know, if if someone's doing a syndication, if there's a syndicator that's that's doing a webinar, are they spending any time at all talking about here's our financing structure, here's our financing strategy, here's why we think it makes sense, and this is why we're comfortable with it. So understanding the risks of, of the capital structure, they're if they're buying a really large property and they're they're doing a 75 to 80% bridge loan. There could be situations where that that is the right execution, but there could also be situations where that's not the right execution. You know, if it's if it's a really large property and they're doing an eighty percent LTC bridge loan, well, you know that sponsor, that key principal, they better have really strong personal liquidity so that you know if there are issues in the property that come up, let's say they need five hundred thousand dollars to to carry them through, you know, some a soft period in the market or capex comes in higher than expected. Well, you know, ideally they have uh, the personal cash on hand to be able to carry that project. So that's something that's important. Another thing that's important is who's on their team. You know, are they working with experienced key principals that you know have done this before? 
Do they have the right um, attorneys and you know, financing brokers on their team that, that have experience? Um, so that's also important. And then just also, you know, the underwriting itself. So, so looking at reviewing their, their pro forma, um, reviewing, you know, what, what types of rents are they projecting? Are these rents that they're projecting, are these already being achieved in the market or are there really no good rent comps on this property? And then the last thing, you know, that on the underwriting is just like the, the exit cap rate. I think current market cap rates are, you know, around five and a half percent. You know, depending on the property type and the market, let's just say it's five and a half percent. So if an exit, you know, current cap rates are, are 5.5%, then when they're selling the property in year three in their projection, they probably shouldn't be using a, a 4.5% cap rate um, when looking at their sale. And I've and I've seen that as well. I mean, I saw I saw a recent uh syndication where it, the borrower was was doing a, a fixed rate loan with 60% LTV. So like those both sound good because it's, you know, it's lower leverage yeah. and they're 60% LTV. But on the flip side, my negative uh, look at it was they have a loan with a defeasance prepayment penalty, which is similar to a yield maintenance prepay. But let's just say it's, let's just for the sake of you, let's just say it's a, a yield maintenance prepayment penalty. But on their exit, you know, in year five, they're not showing any prepayment cost. So they're basically assuming that the borrower is going to assume their Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan that has a 5.5% interest rate. And then the, the sales price they were projecting in year five was a 4.5% cap rate. And so on the on the front end, the loan looks very conservative and it looks like they're, they're getting like a low LTV Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan. Um, but on, on the flip side is when they're going to sell it, um, their exit assumptions to me, you know, just weren't weren't market and didn't make any sense. So there's a lot of different levers that can be that can be pushed and pulled and, and underwriting assumptions. And yeah. you know, it's 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 hard to know. But what I would say is, you know, if you're looking to invest passively, invest with people that you know, invest with people that um, you have a relationship with. And that's what it ultimately comes down to is, you know, do I believe in the sponsor and do I believe in you know their ability to to execute and get it done? Yeah, man, that was gold. Honestly, the um, looking at the exit cap rate and understanding that and and putting it together with the defeasance uh, and yield maintenance and making sure that picture is is absolutely clear. I actually looked at one recently that was very similar to that, um, and it was it just didn't make sense. It was probably a, the similar spread. It was five and a half going in, four and a half going out, and um, it just it was like a, a huge shift in uh, in the in sale price in the price per unit that just didn't over three or four years didn't really make sense. Yeah. Um, it I mean, could. something else, but, something else I would say too, Randall. And like, it's, you know, I, I can't, it's not the same standard for all deals, but a lot of times, you know, if there's very little cash flow, if the, if the total return, total projected return is 80% and they're showing, you know, 5% cash on cash in year one, five and a half in year two, 6% in year three, like there's hardly any cash on cash. And then all of a sudden in year five, there's like this big pop in appreciation because they're, they're selling the property. That's also a little bit of a, that's worth looking into. It's, you know, yeah. why, why is all of the return back ended here? Why isn't there more return, you know, during the whole period? And there, yeah. there could be a good reason for that. It could be because they're buying a distressed property and the property's, you know, 50, 60% occupied and yeah, you know, they're having to take a bridge loan at the higher rate. So there's, there's really no cash flow in year one or year two, but it could also be that they're buying a property at a really tight cap rate with very low going in cash on cash. And then they're projecting that in year five, they're going to sell it for an even tighter cap rate. And that's, you know, something like that's a little bit more uh, yeah. problematic. That's a very quick um, indicator that you can look at if you're reviewing somebody's OM on a deal or offering on a deal. I mean, that's that's typically you're seeing that cash on cash number in any kind of memorandum or offering um, that that a sponsor is putting forth. And so if you see that, you can key into it very quickly and say, there should be a story here. <laughs> what is it? Okay. Right. It is, it is exactly that. Okay. We're doing a bridge and we're going to re reposition the property and doing all these things. But um, as an investor, yeah, you should know that going in because that's a very different strategy than an investor or like a limited partner looking for cash flow on an ongoing basis because that's not that deal. That's more like a, a development deal where there's no cash flow, big pop at the end, go on your way once you get your money. Um, 
So just again, yeah, know that very good advice there. So um, got a couple minutes left here. So uh, again, on the on the personal investing side, you know, what are some of your strategies, and and you know, what are you looking for in deals that you're you're buying right now? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, you know, I, I've mostly invested passively, okay. and a lot of times I'm investing passively w- with my clients just because I I know them really well. And then I also, um, I know the properties really well. I've, I've underwritten it myself and understand the business plan and understand the market they're buying in. So those are just the properties I'm most familiar with and the sponsors I'm most familiar with. So a lot of times um, I would invest passively um, in those types of deals. In 2022, I bought um, a smaller property just on my own with no partners, um, just because I wanted to have that experience of, of owning a property with no part with no partners. So I bought a nine unit property here in Dallas, a really good location in Dallas. It's uh, in Old East Dallas. The property had been fully rehabbed and upgraded, almost no deferred maintenance. It was really kind of a turnkey uh, type of deal. And it was actually a, a pretty good going in cap rate in a dense infill location with lots of population growth, a lot of jobs, a lot of in- income growth. So I felt like that was one where you know I could buy it on my own with no partners. I didn't think it was going, it's not going to be a home run. I think it'll be a single or double. It's a, it's a get rich slow type of deal. And, you know, for me personally, it made sense because I, 2022, there, there weren't, I didn't see a whole lot of uh, passive opportunities that I was interested in. And, you know, being an agent and being a real estate professional myself, um, I also want to get uh, depreciation and be able to offset some of my commission income with depreciation. And so I was looking for, something to invest, you know, also just as a tax, as a tax shelter. Yeah. And so my thought process was, okay, we're getting into the second half of the year. I haven't had a lot of passive investing opportunities to invest in, you know, this property in, in East Dallas looks interesting to me. And so I ended up buying that and, and being able to um, enjoy the depreciation and the, the tax benefit. Yeah. So How, how's um, it going? So you've got it. Are uh, you, are you doing day to day on a nine unit that, or, or do you have, uh, have you outsourced that to property management? What's are you going changing toilets? You got your plumber wrench yet, or what? <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, I can I can hardly change a light bulb, so I don't <laughs> think you want me doing anything with the plumbing on on any of these units. Yeah, no, we we have a we have a third party property manager, and that's part of the reason I chose the market that I chose is that you know if you're buying a nine unit property or a ten, less than twenty unit property in, in a lot of different locations, it's it's very hard to find decent third-party management. Um, but this property is really in the city of Dallas. It's about 10 minutes away from where I live. So I can I can go by there at any point in time and, and check in on it. And there's also a lot more third-party property management companies for these these size properties um, here in the city. So my, my thought process was it'd be a lot easier to find someone to manage um, you know, a property of that size if it's in fill location in Dallas versus if it's out in you know, Garland or Mesquite or Waxahachie or, or, or wherever. So we have third party management and, um, you know, I've been pretty pleased with them so far. And, and, you know, so far it's been solid. We, we've been able to get some, uh, some growth on, on rent and then also, um, on, a, on other income and, you know, expenses have been steady and we're, we're cash flow positive. So, yeah. um, I've been, I've been happy with it. Yeah. Great. So is that something that like a product type that you want to duplicate? And just run some repeat and kind of add it to the portfolio, or is it just you think it's one off and and you'll start going passive again once the opportunities present? Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I think um, you know, I think I might, I could end up holding on to it forever, or I could see myself selling it after a few years and and ten thirty one into a larger property. You know, I think the next property that I I buy, I want to buy something that's a little bit more of a heavy lift and more value add. And something that really has um, some more opportunity for appreciation. So I think that that's what I'll be looking into. And you know, I haven't really been as active on on doing syndication and and, and raising money and, and buying properties. But you know, that's another avenue I, I I may explore. You know, here over the next year or two, depending on how busy I am with my my day job and you know running McKinney Realty Capital and um, you know helping my clients with with financing properties they're buying. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so yeah, a lot of experience, man. Uh, you've got, you've got a well range of, of experience from the LP side, the debt side, 
and and now actually the principal side you're you're going in on them so very cool lots of information thanks for sharing all of your insights uh let me see if there's anything else to wrap up with uh how about how about let's get to know john a little bit you know what's your favorite pastime not related to real estate um my favorite pastime not related to real estate i'm kind of a a jack of all trades master of none when it comes to uh hobbies there's a lot of different things i like to do i like fishing uh like skiing uh play a little bit of golf play a little bit of tennis i've started to get it get a little bit into uh to hunting more recently. So I've been some duck hunting earlier this year, you know, love sports and following sports. I went to uh, the Rangers game here in Dallas uh, last night. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to uh, the Masters uh, this last weekend. So Good I was out, out at Augusta National on Sunday. Yeah. So that was really cool. So yeah, I like to read. I can show you my bookcases here, my, my, uh, my place and a lot, a lot of books in the shelf. So love to read. So a lot of, a lot of different interests for me. Stay, stay pretty busy outside yeah. of uh, just real estate. Very, very cool. So masters, how was that? You enjoy it? It was uh, amazing. Yeah. Uh, my my yeah. brother was out there recently. Sorry, I didn't mean to catch you up. My brother's out there recently. He yeah. went and, and what, after he came back, he's like, okay, I'm, I'm looking for a house out there. He said, it's beautiful. And there's some new developments that are coming up around there. Um, they actually oh, yeah. flew out and looked again. Yeah. So you buy a place out there, man. We'll go out. <laughs> yeah. No, Ag- yeah, yeah. Augusta's really cool. Um, I mean, Augusta National, the, the grounds are immaculate. Um, just so much history and tradition right there. Seeing all, all the all the golfers in person and seeing some really cool shots uh live was awesome. Would have loved to see it be a little bit closer between uh between Rom and Kepka, they're going yeah. to the final round, but we were lucky because we, we got there on Sunday and the, the weather uh, on Saturday was, was, was pretty bad, but um, Sunday afternoon weather was, was perfect. So yeah. did you make it out on Saturday? Day. We, uh, we got in on, I, I stayed in Atlanta on Saturday night and yeah. we were planning on going to uh, the masters on Sunday all along. We had, we had a ticket for, for Sunday. So we were going on Sunday but yeah, I got in on, on Saturday, staying the last Saturday night, and then we drove to Augusta on yeah. uh, on Sunday morning. Yeah, nice. Did you get any rounds in when you're out there? Did you play? Um, no. I didn't. No. No. Yeah. no. yeah. Well, then I, I was going to ask this, but I don't know. Maybe it, you just answered it. What's the best thing that's happened in the last 60 days? <laughs> Is it- yeah, uh, man. Um I would say probably probably getting invited to go to go to the Masters might yeah. might be the might be the best thing that happened in the last yeah. sixty days. Yeah, pretty awesome. Yeah, and and then final name one or two people who've been most influential to your success. I mean, I think that's a easy question. It'd probably be my parents, and you know, just uh, they've they been role models for me, and you know, they were um, hardworking people, and um, you know, humble, and treated people well. Um, so I think they're probably my, my best, my best role models. Awesome. All right, John, it's been great having you on. Thanks again for sharing your knowledge, your, your experience and, and all that. We'll, uh, we'll catch you guys on the next episode. Did you know that 80% of the agents we speak with got into real estate in order to gain passive income so they could obtain financial freedom and become work optional. If you want to stay up to date, the best way is to make sure you're subscribed. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and do it now. We'll catch you on the next episode.